Hello everyone and welcome to Rise on Fire. Um, I'm so excited today. We are going to be doing something brand new. Um, this is the beginning of a brand new series where we're going to be looking at the writings of Paul the Apostle. And in this video, we're going to start off with Romans and uh, specifically around Romans chapter 1 to 3. And we're going to look at what Paul is writing about and, and, and how, because I don't know if you've ever realized but Paul is really hard to understand. And in fact, Peter actually said that the things that Paul writes about are hard to understand. And those who are unlearned in their ways will twist his words to their own destruction. And he actually connected with being lawless. And so even today we see that oftentimes that Paul's writings have been used in that exact way where his writings have been upheld as that Paul is speaking against the law and, uh, you know, he's abolishing the law and, you know, he's speaking of, of, about a freedom from the law. Now, we're going to look at what is he really saying? What does he mean by all those statements? And he talks about many things throughout his writings. And we're going to be looking at the most important ones, um, especially in this video regarding chapter one to three. But it's not just going to be me. Um, I'm so excited because I'm going to be I'm doing this 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 um, episode with Christina as well. Christina, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Christina, as PD mentioned. I'm his fiance, and we're going to be going through the book of Romans, as he mentioned. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope it's a wonderful um, time just to understand who Paul was, what he was actually saying, so we can understand the context and grow deeper in our relationship with the Father through this. Right. So this, the format is, of this video, video is going to be very in depth. We're going to be looking kind of almost a verse by verse study um, in, throughout his writings of Romans here. And uh, before I continue, I'd also like to say that the way we're going to be talking about these things, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you grew up in a very traditional Christian background, you know, some of the things we say may, may sound quite out of place or quite different from what you've heard in a, in, in a typical church. And I want to submit that many of his writings have been incredibly misunderstood in Christianity as a whole. And if and so I want to ask you humbly that to to consider what we tell you um, and, 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 and taste everything we say. And yeah, and then let us learn and let us see really what Paul is saying. You know, I remember when I started out with Paul's writings, uh, I read the book of Galatians, I think that was one of the first books I sat down with to read from him. And I remember when I, and I read it, I was like, oh my word, like I read like a whole chapter or two chapters and I had no idea what I was reading. I had no idea what Paul was saying. And I had to go back and I had to read it again and I read it again and, I, and I'm still like, I had no idea what he is saying. This guy, he speaks in circles. He speaks of things I don't understand. And, and I realized and I asked God, why, Lord, is it this hard? And I, and I prayed my way through it and I went back and I read it over and over and over and over again, countless times until it clicked. And, you know, I want to submit that Paul's letters was, was given, well, Paul... God used Paul to write his letters in a very on purpose way and that he is hard to understand. But the reason why is because he's writing to, in, to the spirit, to our spirit. He's not writing to please the flesh. He's not writing in a way that the flesh can understand either. You need the spirit. You need to, the, the, the sermon of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand what he is saying. And so I encourage you to, after this, go and sit like I did a few years back and read over and over and over and over again, praying through it with intimacy with the Father until it clicks. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, so I, the first off, I'm, what I'd, I, we would just like to introduce you to the book of Romans and, and give you some background on it as well. So we need to ask a few questions about, you know, who was the audience, you know, for example, that, that Paul was writing to. Um, he says in Romans 1 verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he starts off the letter, first chapter, early verses here, and he's saying this is to all those in Rome. So this letter is not written to me or to you it is written to the people in rome but it is written for us it's for us to see what he 
he said to apply to our lives but we need to understand it's not to us that means there are things that the romans had to uh, had they had a cultural background they had certain things going around their culture that certain uh, factions and different kinds of controversies that we may not have today and but we need to understand all those things so we can understand what paul's really saying with regards to it christina do you maybe want to add in regards to the roman what was going on there all right so in regards to like what pd just shared we need to understand first of all like he says in the very beginning of romans this is to the romans so who was his audience what was the cultural um, environment they lived in? What was the history? What was everything that was connected to the people he was writing to? As well as, of course, even going a step back, who was Paul? So when we take all of these things into context, into consideration, it helps us to understand. And it brings the Book of Romans to life as well as it brings it into the light as well. We know Paul, he was a student of Gamaliel, which required him to memorize the entire Torah mm -hmm. and also the prophets. And also, of course, we know he called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews, and he said he never went against the law of God or even any of the Jewish customs or the customs of the fathers. So we know he would not say he never went against and then teach against, because we know Paul was consistent. And so in that, that was who Paul was. And then who were the people he were talking to? It's like Petey said, people who lived in Rome, which would be those who came from a pagan background, the Greeks, Romans, who knew nothing of the word of God. And Paul was speaking to them, the Gentiles. He was also speaking to those who were Jewish who were living in Rome, as well as those who were um, more zealous in their faith in Judaism and those who had been living as Gentiles but were Jewish in lineage. So he was speaking to all of these groups. And that is why he'll be saying certain things specifically in this book of Romans to address both groups. Right, exactly. And you know, what you mentioned about him studying under Gamliel, Gamliel was like in, an incredibly um, well-known uh, rabbi and leader in, the t in this day. And you know, that means that Paul really had to memorize and understand the Torah incredibly well. He was like, he, he describes himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees, like the, he was like the, the top of the top, you know, in, a scholar, if you will, of the word. And, you know, so he retained all that understanding of the Torah. And so he's speaking from a perspective with that. And he knows the Torah so well that he will ne would never say anything against it. Because we need to remember that the Torah, what we, when we said the Torah is the five uh, first, the books of Moses. And, and, you know, that was given by God, word of God, straight from him. And Paul knew it. And Paul also knew that we, we read in Deuteronomy that we're not allowed to add or take away from the Torah. So no matter what covenant, what wherever we are in the, on the timeline, God's word stands and it says that we're not allowed to add or take away. So if we need to go with, into this with that foundational understanding that Paul can never speak against the Torah. The Torah. He can never speak against that foundation that he even um, learned and understood so well. And if we, if he ever seems to be speaking against it, we need to really ask the question: um, You know, are we really understanding him correctly? Because either Paul, in that moment of him speaking against it, is a false prophet, because only a false prophet would, according to Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomy 13 test, or we're just understanding, misunderstanding what he is really trying to tell us. Okay. All right, exactly. So what Peter just said, but Peter, when he spoke that Paul is difficult to understand, we must remember that when he, he was speaking from his background, he studied under Gamaliel, he knew the Torah in and out, backwards and forwards, he had memorized the whole thing. And those of us who are not, who have not studied the Torah in depth, some of the things he says can be hard to understand, but we need to remember who Paul was, also who he was speaking to. These letters are not written to us, but they are written for us. Right, and that brings us to kind of, I guess, to, into around verse 16, where he, he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, first off, he says in something interesting, he says that this is for everyone, but it's for the Jew first. Now, what does that mean? We, we need to remember that when Yeshua came, Jesus, when he came, he, I want to remind you of that, that story of him with the, the woman at the well, and, and, and she's like, you know, um, where can I get this? And, she, she, and he says, I have not come out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she says, but you know, can I, can, does the dog not even eat 
from your from your table the breadcrumbs you know Yeshua in that moment he was making he was referring back to the same thing that Paul is saying here that he came to the Jew, for his own people first not only for them not at all but for them and and it and it just it speaks to priority it speaks to what are our priorities because when we look at can I speak of Christianity mainstream Christianity today are we approaching this thing in the same with with this in mind too are we reaching out to the Jew too are we going and proclaiming the gospel and their Messiah to them because by the way Yeshua was a Jew he was Jewish right Jewish father mother all the way through he was Hebrew in his root and so we're following a Jewish Messiah even though you know he was not uh, he was not submitting to the the customs of Juda Judaism that actually went against his father's instructions but he was culturally a Jew and and similarly he, now he 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 went to proclaim the gospel to them but not only to them to for everyone and then he goes on and he also says like i said um the righteous shall live by faith now i like me and, me and christina we, we would just like to explain to you what um faith is because we need to ask the question when he says the righteous shall live by faith what is faith you know when we when i walk up to someone on the street and i'll tell them you know what is faith people will say faith is it's believing okay it's it's a belief in something it's it's an and really when we dig deeper we, we would say it's a mental ascent to or intellectual under uh, belief in something where we go and we you know we 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 think on something and now we believe it and and that's it but that's really not what faith is that's a greek mindset it's it's only telling really half the story because the hebrew mindset of faith and the mindset that God really has when he talks about faith is a, a, an understanding of, 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 of doing what you believe and, and walking in what you believe. So it's not just a feeling. It's not just a mental ascent. It's not just an intellectual idea. or a, It's about doing all these things that you say you believe as well. Right. Exactly. So as Pete just said, in regards to the Greek mindset and the Hebrew mindset, the Greek mindset is very much focused on the mind. I mentally believe, and it's even a philosophical kind of thing. It's really focused on what you believe in your head, but you might not actually do it. Real faith, you could say Hebrew faith in the Hebrew mindset as um, listed in the scripture, biblical faith, really. It is even summed up in the word Shema. It is hear and obey. Because you have faith, there will be obedience that goes with faith. There will be that action, that active faith. Not just mental faith that I know, but then I don't do. It's that I believe and I do because of that faith. So faith inspires and prompts obedience. And that even actually gets right back to Paul's introduction to this whole book of Romans. Because we remember the first few verses sets the entire stage for this book that he's writing, this letter that he's writing rather, to the people in Rome, when he says, I'm gonna just read a few verses, because um, this carries along right with what you were saying. When he says, um, I'll just start from the beginning. So Paul, a servant of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Yeshua Messiah, our Lord. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his namesake. So we have this, everything that Paul is talking about in the rest of this letter is all about how everyone, Gentile as well as Jew, we're all called to the exact same calling, obedience, through faith and we've received grace and apostleship to reach all the nations through and for his name's sake but to walk in obedience through faith they're coupled and they go hand in hand exactly and that also then comes back to, and it means basically that if you say that you believe but you do not have obedience to have as evidence of what you believe in other words works that follow and demonstrate what you believe then we can only conclude and god will only conclude that you don't really believe you know john and john we read that whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked 
that is huge. That means that if you do not walk as you walk, but you say you believe that those words, it's, it comes from that Greek mindset and it really doesn't mean anything. It, this is, this is, and we're going to start digging into this more in a moment, but this is a big misunderstanding where people um, often struggle to make the distinction between are we now saved by works? Are we saved by grace? Are we saved by both? Are we, how does these things, where do works fit into this picture? And, you know, because Paul does say we are saved by, through faith in, in Messiah, right? We're not saved by our works, but yeah, what does that mean, right? Um, so in the following uh, few verses, in around Romans 1, verse 28 and onwards, he, he, he talk, I'm going to read for you the following. He talk, he li Paul lists a few sins for us. He says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to the base mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, mal maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, and the list goes on. And he says, Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, Paul is giving uh, a list of all kinds of different sins and things. And if you if we read in some a little into it, he says they're full of envy. You know, that's, for example, we can look into the Torah. That's Cain and Abel. You know, he, they're gossips. That's like Miriam. Yeah, when she gossiped against Moses. And then, you know, we have all these different, pointing by all these sins but we need to ask the question where did he get these where did he how does he know what is sin and what is not where did paul get his understanding of right and wrong now in romans 7 he gives us the answer very clearly he says romans 7 verse 7 what then shall we say that the law is sin question mark by no means yet if it had not been for the law i would not have known sin for I would not have known what it is to covet if the Lord not said, you shall not covet. So he says, hey, all these things, basically all these things that he's mentioned here, he got this from the law. And he says, I would not have known what any of these things, that any of these are sin if it was not for the law. For the law gives us the knowledge of sin. The law shows us what sin is. 1 John 3 verse 4 says, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's the definition of the word sin. And what's interesting, even in back to Romans 7, like Petey just went to, what's interesting, when you go to that chapter and you open up your Bible, the very first thing you see is that chapter heading, which says, released from the law, bound to Christ. So we have this idea that when we're approaching what Paul is saying, that all of a sudden he's, he's getting rid of the law. We're, we're released from that burdensome law because after all it's it's revealing sin so is it sin well paul addresses that right as pd said the law is not sin in fact what did paul say he said the law is holy righteous and good and interestingly enough even though a heading might influence the way we read and the way we approach certain scripture verses paul actually is talking about more than one law here when he says and I'm jumping a bit ahead, but he says, for in my inner being, this is in chapter seven, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. We have that juxtaposition, that contrast, Sin is an opposition to God's law. So when you are sinning, you are, in, you are breaking God's law. 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. But rather, as Paul says here, I delight in God's law. So he's not getting rid of God's law in this chapter at all. As in actually opposition, he is upholding it, even as he says previously in Romans 3.31. Right, exactly. And so he then goes on in, in Romans 2 and Romans 2 12, and he, and he talks about um, a really interesting thing. I, I want to uh, read this to you. He says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Okay. And all who have sinned in the law, okay, will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. 
Now it's interesting, right? Because he's he's saying, let's, let's unpack this, right? He's saying, for all who have sinned without the law perish without the law. So if you don't have the law, right, and you sin, you perish without the law. So in other words, if if you know, let's imagine that you're you're in a country, right? Your 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 government, your president, he comes and he says, Okay, guys, we have decided that we're gonna abolish every single law of our land. There is no more, you can do what you want. There is no not gonna be any consequence for anything that you do wrong. You can go and and murder and and steal and kill and destroy, do what you want. Right. If you go and murder, if you go and steal, if you go and do whatever is against the law of the land, there whether there is an actual law uh, written on stone, if you will, a law that has um, been in the constitution or whatever, um, and it, whether it is there or not, the consequence in our world will still come upon you so if you murder there will still be consequences that come upon you if you commit adultery there will still be consequences your family will suffer children will suffer etc so he's saying that hey you, you know let's if you don't um, you don't believe there's a law you don't follow the law whatever that's fine but you're going to perish without the law regardless we can't fool ourselves into thinking there is no law it's totally abolished and now therefore there is no kind of be no more consequence for breaking it the fact is, is that, well, in the next verse, he then says, all who have sinned, then he, he juxtaposes it with this. He says, all who have sinned in the law, those in other words who are in the law, but who have sinned will be judged by the law. And, and I get that difference, right? First, he said those without the law will perish, but now he says those in the law will be judged by it. Which is better, to perish or to be judged? You see that word judged actually it can actually also be in the if you go into the Greek it can also mean that word can also mean esteem ordained or determined so he actually sees it can all it can also mean that all who have sinned in the law will be esteemed by the law because if you have sinned you know the your the law can esteem if you have not sinned for example the law can esteem you but if you've sinned the law will judge you so then here in the next verse he says for it's not the hearers of the law who will be just who, will be, who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, it's interesting. He's saying it's not the hearer. Just hearing the law is not what justifies you before God. No matter what, it's about doing it. That's when you will be justified. That is when you will be, when, when, when justification is, can be a good thing. It's not just a bad word. Um, you, can, uh, you can have a court, you can stand before a judge and be cleared. You see, but if you have, if you are absolutely lawless and you walk in total disobedience, you're going to stand before a judge, and you won't be cleared. In fact, you will. There will be no, if you will, atonement for you. There will be. There is oftentimes no mercy for someone who totally just rebels against a law, right? So, um, the 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 fact is, is that you, this is really talking to, you know, a lot, a lot of people will try and use this to say the law he's saying the law is a bad thing but really he's saying that hey you need to do the law because if you don't do the law you won't be justified because you what why see we need to ask the question what is um you, who is yeshua right here's the word made flesh that means that he is um he 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 walked out his father's word perfectly when he was in the flesh so he walked it out perfectly he never sinned because like we said sin is a transgression of the law he never sinned and so therefore he's a perfect instruction that walks a perfect example a law in a way a law simply means a teaching or an instruction a a a, a way of, of of living right and so really what we are we can then see is that we can really fill this in with the name of yeshua because we can then read for all who have sinned without yeshua will perish without him and all who have sinned in him in yeshua will be judged by god so if you we're all sinner we're all sinners we're all sinning but there's a difference between being in him or out outside of him you can be in a relationship with god and sin or you can be out of relationship with god and sin you can be lawless and re in rebellion against god you can say you believe but that means nothing if you're not obedient 
or you can be say god i love you i'm obedient to you lord father save me lord by your grace and mercy show favor to me and because of that i am going to be obedient i want to follow you i want to be obedient and walk as you walk because i want to be merciful as you are merciful right <clears throat> exactly as pd was saying everything you shared and keeping the law is not something we can do in our own right or our own strength it's only through his spirit and dwelling within us that empowers and enables us to keep the Torah, to keep his word of life. And in that, what does it mean to keep Torah? Well, Yeshua summed it up. And remember, this is the summation. This is the thesis statement. When he says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. These are the pillars on which the entire Torah stands. It is that love. So we need to, how do we love God? Well, the Torah tells us how to. How do we love our neighbor? Well, again, that's where God's law was given. That instruction was given, that love letter to his people to tell us how to love him, how to love our neighbor, and how to walk in that unity. Right, exactly. And it, it really connects well with Paul, what he says next, because um, he then talks about this law written on the heart kind of thing. So he, I'm going to read to you Romans 2, verse 14 and 15. He says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature, nature means what is natural, like it comes easily, do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So it's quite beautiful because he's now talking about the new covenant. And Jer we read about this also in the prophets in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, where he says, I will make a, um, a, a new covenant with the house of Israel and house of Judah or my law on their hearts. Right. And in Ezekiel, um, I believe, 38, he also talks about how he will change our nature and this is basically what he's talking about here in Romans with their na by nature, they're going to do the things of the Torah or the law. So, by the way, Torah simply means instruction and teaching. So anyway, he, he's saying that um, these people, they don't have the law and that they're not, um, they're not, it may not necessarily be incredibly learned in the law. But because remember, as we established in the beginning, many of the people he was writing to were um, came just out of paganism. They they had no background like Paul himself had of growing up with the Torah. They had nothing except at this point really the spirit in them. Now he's saying that they don't have the law, but they by nature do what it requires, and then by that they're a law to themselves. Um, and then they say, and he, and he actually says that their conscience accuses or excuses them. So. The spirit in them, because they're baptized in water and then baptized in the spirit, which is so important. Now the spirit comes and, and dwells their temple and convicts them of sin and righteousness. And so then by nature, they're going to stop stealing. They're going to stop murdering. They're going to stop drinking blood. They're going to stop doing all these things. And that's the change of nature that God gives us. That's why having the spirit is absolutely essential for our walk in intimacy with God. That's what, like, like Christina said earlier, you can't, cannot keep the law of God by your own works, your own, your own um, drive or anything. Many have tried and many have failed. We have seen that throughout scripture demonstrated over and over and over again, that we cannot do it, but God sent a spirit that now changes our nature, writes his law in our hearts, where we want to and are able to be obedient and walk as Yeshua walked. <laughs> exactly. So like PD was just saying, God changes our nature. It's an inward transformation that happens when his spirit comes within us, when like we were baptized. And like even going back to Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and you may live. It is that circumcision of your heart, that inward transformation, so that we will desire to keep his Torah and his spirit, which enables us to do so. And it's even talked about, um, Paul mentions it in relation to baptism in Colossians 2, 11 through 12. He says, in him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature with a circumcision performed by Messiah, 
not by human hands. It's that circumcision of the heart, that inward transformation of his spirit. And having been buried with him in baptism, you were raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And even Ezekiel, like PD mentioned, prophesied looking forward to this very same thing in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my laws and be careful to obey my rules. This is the new covenant. This is God changing us from the inside out, circumcising our hearts, filling us with his spirit and empowering us to walk as Yeshua walked, to follow his word and to grow in a relationship with him. Exactly. And, you know, but then there's also the other side of it where we have those who also boast in the law. So, you know, Paul was very much speaking to an audience, like we said, um, pagans or people who are very new to the faith, but then also to people who are, you know, who there, there was also very much influences of of a different a different party, very often called or known as the circumcision party, um, where you know they basically a sect which believed and held onto the tradition a tradition of man which was not found in the Word of God that said that the way that we are saved is through circumcision and that the circumcision is the conversion process that enable it makes us enables us to be saved and really then salvation is now connected to a certain work and not to this faith that we have which is then which we then demonstrate in our works and then you know that's what saves us saved by faith through grace through grace um <laughs> saved in grace through faith and um so Basically, so this this party was Paul oftentimes referred to them, and now he's going to write to them in Romans six, um, two verse sixteen. He says that uh, on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law, and boast in God and know His will and approve what is excellent, because you're instructed from the law, and if you're sure that you yourself are a God to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness an instruction of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law, the embodiment of the knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must, must, one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who up, abhor idols, do you rob temples? And now this is really common. This is, this is something that we see very often today. He says, you who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, among the Gentiles because of you. So we often see this and we see this often. We, we see this over and over with the Pharisees as well, where they boasted in their in their ability to keep the law they relied on the law and now when paul says you rely on the law what does he really mean he's not he's he's talking about this thing of relying on the law to be saved relying on the law and the law alone to be declared right before god how well you keep the law is going to define how well you how your chance of appearing before God and be, uh, being able to be saved by him and being able to come into his presence, etc. Now, that is an incredibly boastful thing to believe, to think that I can be so perfect, so well um, behaved and never sin that I can actually be so as perfect as God is. Because see, you will need to be as perfect and holy and set apart as God to be able to be come into his presence in that way. So this is the the purpose of Messiah. This is why Yeshua had to come is because we cannot by our own works keep the law in this way by our flesh and we therefore there's no access for us to God. The only way we can come into his presence is by the atonement the blood speak was that was spilled for us and the, which cleanses us of sin and enables God to basically look at us through the blood of Christ, if you will. So um, basically, he, he says, you who boast in the Lord dishonor God by breaking the law. Now, 
Because those who, and this is very common, those who boast in the law are the very ones who most often break the law. Because if you boast the law, you are in, in the law and your ability to keep it and all that, in that action, you are basically rejecting what God has sent to enable you to really keep the law because you cannot do it alone. You must have the Spirit of God living in you through faith in Yeshua. And that is what enables you to keep the law and to be saved. But we're not saved by keeping by 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 the law. We are saved by faith in him. Now that now where does the law then fit in? The law simply fits in into we must be obedient and walk as he walked if we say that we abide in him. If we say that we love him and, and we want and all that, we must do what he said. So we are saved by him. But the, the law demonstrates our faith. It demonstrates our willingness to, to, to and, our, and, our, and, 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 love, and love for him. I, I cannot tell Christina that I love her, but not do anything in, in works to demonstrate that love to her. I can say to her as much as I want that I love her, but if I never do anything to demonstrate it, she'll never believe me. And actually, I'm not even fooling anyone because anyone would be able to see that, that I'm a liar and the truth is not in me. So that's kind of what where it all fits in. Right, exactly. Like PD said, um, obedience or walking in it is a witness and a testimony of the faith. And it's not something to boast about. Like, Guys, he mentioned not boasting. Paul says not boasting in your lineage or boasting in your keeping of the law, but boast in God because it's all about him. He is the law giver. You did not create it. So it's not something you can boast about how well you did this or how well you kept that. Because even in effect, by boasting, by that pride, you are breaking the law. The law, you are supposed to keep it in love, love for God, love for your neighbor. And as Yeshua said to certain Pharisees, you who tithe in your cumin and mint, you forget and neglect the weightier matters of the law. What is the law all about? It's about how to love the Lord, how to love your neighbor, how to be a light to the nations, and how to spread his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we're supposed to do. That is our focus, not on how well I did this, that command, or how well I did that over here, but how well am I being an example? How well am I walking in Yeshua's footsteps, spreading his light, his love, his kingdom, by going out and being obedient, to his law that is given as instruction so that we can be a blessing to those around us and we can spread his word of truth through the empowerment, the enablement that his spirit gives us because we can only do it through him. Right. And and so, you know, he says that those who boast in the law, they are the ones that, well, he's saying, you know, you break the law. And, you know, if you think about it, that word boasting, it really is pride right it's it's i am so it, it takes a lot of pride to be able to believe that i can pull that anyone can pull that off and you know so basically in that action of thing of, of relying on the law or believing that you know um i can do all these things and it's by me and not by the empowerment of the spirit really um in that action your boasting is the sin in itself and pride is an opposition to love you cannot love with pride you cannot be humble you, you need humility to be able to love and so that's why you know like christina said this is everything we're talking about today everything 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 is about love it's about walking in love and you cannot walk in love by boasting in your ability to keep the law in any form or matter. You, if you want to boast in something, boast in your Messiah who died for you, who empowers you and has grace for you when you fail because you do and I do. Any man who thinks he does not stumble is a liar because we all stumble in many ways. All right. Right. Like Paul, I'm just going to go on that thought really quick. Paul was saying, um, elsewhere that both Jew and Greek, we have all sinned. No matter who you are, we are all in the same place. We all need his word and we all need Messiah. We all need his spirit. And we cannot boast in our own works because it's all him. It's all his spirit. And now in that vein, going back to um, even what Petey mentioned a little bit back in regards to the circumcision faction that he mentioned and why Paul's even addressing it is because there were those, like he said, who were teaching you must be circumcised to be saved. That's not in Torah. That was an addition. 
and that was created by certain rabbinical authorities in the House of Shammai, which we can talk about at a different time, or you can research it on your own. But the House of Shammai taught in their conversion process that you would need to obey to their authority and be under their authority. And in that, you must be circumcised first to enter into the fellowship. Before faith, before anything else, you must do this act. And Paul's like, no, faith comes first. It's that inward transformation. That's Torah. As we read in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, God will circumcise your heart. It's that inward transformation. Obedience follows, but it's that inward first. It's faith that inspires obedience. And this, um, these teachings that were coming, that were influencing some of these Jewish circles that Paul was speaking to, was this doctrine of you must do this to then enter in or to be saved. You must do this, you must be under the rabbinical authority, which was not even in alignment with Torah. And so Paul was bringing everything back to the word of God, to Torah, obedience and faith. Yes, and that's a good point because I think a lot of people think that before um, the new covenant, um, <clears throat> we were basically, we were justified by works, but actually it's never been that way. From the very beginning, even with Abraham, the word says, uh, Paul himself says actually that, you know, Abraham was justified by his faith. It wasn't by his works either. It wasn't, in, in fact, um, Abraham had faith first before and was justified and declared righteous by his faith before he was even circumcised ever. Exactly. So, right. Sorry, jump. Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham obeyed by faith first. You can go ahead. Right, exactly. So it's it's not it's never been the teaching of God. You know, it's not this thing that suddenly changed, or it's always been about faith in God and and that that we have been saved. Um, so this this idea that there was some kind of a shift is just not it's just not true. There was, like um, Christina said, there was the 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 the, the circumcision party who. Um, who basically taught that, you know, that, you know, you, we are saved by our works, but that's never been what God ever taught. And um, it's just not God's heart anyway. So in Romans 2 verse 25, he then goes, he, he talks about this and he says, for circumcision indeed is a value. Okay, that's a, that's a very controversial statement. But so he says, circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So he's saying that, hey, you can you can say, you know, he's talking to this party like we've talked about, who's there, oh, you need to be circumcised first and, and all that. But he's saying, hey, yeah, no, that's a good, that's nice and all that. But listen, if you go to be circumcised, but you do not have love, you do not walk in obedience to the instructions of God, you don't, because like we said, love is obedience to instructions. It's all connected then your circumcision, your physical circumcision actually becomes like uncircumcision. It, it means absolutely nothing. Right. So, so yeah, so he, said, he goes on next verse and he says that, so if a man who is uncircumcised, physically uncircumcised, keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So he's basically saying, I, you know, this guy who's not actually even, is uncircumcised physically, but who is obedient to the instructions, who loves God, who loves his neighbor, sir, he is a better believer than you who boast in your circumcision and think you are declared right by your circumcision. Exactly, because circumcision in the beginning was supposed to be an outward sign of the inward. If you just have an outward sign with no inward, no inward transformation, no circumcision of your heart, what is the purpose? What are you doing? So someone who is actually circumcised in their heart and walking in Torah and has not come, is not it's circumcision physically, but they're actually walking in Torah and they're seeking and God circumcised their heart. That is the key thing. That is the, actually what the focus right here that Paul is addressing. That is most important. Exactly. So he says that um, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have writ the written code and circumcision but break the law, right? Like we've said. And then he says, for no one is a Jew who is mere one merely outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, right? He's saying circumcision is outward and physical. A Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So 
he's saying that like, like Christina said, circumcision is of the heart. And, and we read this Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. He talks about God shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed. And Jeremiah 4 verse 4, he says, circumcise yourself to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart. It's always been the message that you need to circumcise your heart. You need to, and, and what does circumcision mean? It means to cut your heart. So, you know, when you're cut in your heart, it means that you're like, you're like, you know, it's like you're, it's like when the gospel is preached and someone is, is, is almost, uh, is cut to the heart. It's like they're, they're like, they, they want to repent. They want to change. There's an inward transformation because of that, that cut in their heart, if you will. And then that cut in their heart, it changes insight first by faith belief in god saying god i love you god come into my life god help me and then outward there's a circum there's a circumcision if you will there is a a your flesh then follows what has occurred firstly only in your heart by five now suddenly the works come the obedience come and everything else comes outwardly in the but now he's saying hey don't get too stuck on just the outward What's going on in your heart? Do you ha is your heart in the right place? There needs to be communion in these two areas. The outward and the in inward needs to be work and point towards the same thing, and that is Yeshua. You need to have Yeshua's heart, and you need to walk as Him in in in, in your outward appearance too. Exactly. So, like when Yeshua spoke to certain Pharisees, He said. You know, outside you're like whitewashed tombs, but you're full of dead man's bones. You might look great on the outside. You might be doing everything outwardly as you should, but what's going on on the inside? Has your heart been circumcised? Is there an inward transformation? Does his spirit dwell within you? Right, exactly. And and so, you know, he, he, um, he talked about um, circumcision, the instruction specifically here, because of like we said this this party who went around teaching that hey circumcision is how you get saved but i want to submit that it doesn't only apply to the instruction of circumcision it applies to all of god's instructions um you know yeshua he taught on these things he said that whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart so he's talking again about the heart matter and he and he you know for example another one would be you know if you go to feed the poor um, or, or why do you do it? Do you do it to be seen by others or do you do it simply because you love them? You see, so this is the heart of the matter is it is about the heart. <laughs> it's about loving. It's about doing it from the heart and not just as an outward thing. You need the spirit in your heart to change your heart, wreck your heart so that you can then be a change being inside because that's what matters and then outside will follow that okay cool so um what i'd like us to what i'd like to i'd like to read you romans we, we're gonna start talking about romans 3 now we talked through about romans 1 we talked about romans 2 but now i want to talk we're, we're going to continue with this train of the the circumcision party and he and he talks now about the value of it he says that what then is the advantage of the jew okay he talks about what is the value of the jew what is the value of this circumcision much in every way because first indeed that they were entrusted with the words of god for what if some did not believe shall their unbelief nullify the trustworthiness of god so he's basically saying hey guys these people like don't the basically the jewish people do not think of them as lower do not think of them even if they if they're in a place where they're rejecting yeshua do not look down on them because they have value because god has used them mightily you will not believe today as you're sitting there if it was not for the jew if it was not for the ones that god entrusted the words of god to Okay, um, he goes on then in verse 9 and he says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously accused both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So we are not better than they are. And this is a big problem, guys. We have anti Semitism like crazy. We've always had it everywhere throughout the world. Um, we have had it within Christianity in many uh, circles. We have had the many. 
abominations done by the early um, crusades, Catholic Church, etc., where where Jewish people were murdered for what they believe, and because we believe that we're better than they are. And really, we're coming back to the whole boasting thing. For you know, first he addressed those who rely on the law and how boastful they are. Now he's coming back and he's saying, "Hey, you who who want to boast in your identity, whatever that identity is, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, it doesn't matter what you are. We are all we have all fallen, fallen short of God. We have all sinned, and we will all stand before God equally, and we, regardless of our identity in that way, and be judged by Him." Right, like P.D. said, Jewish people, God entrusted his Torah to them. And that's how we even have our scriptures today. They would carefully write each out in each Torah scroll carefully and meticulously to carry forth God's word. And so we have a lot to learn from our brother Judah. But also remembering that as we walk forward in our faith in Yeshua, we're to be a light to the nations. And we're also, as Paul talks about, we all have sinned. And we all need Yeshua. We all need his spirit. And it's all about that walking in obedience through faith. And Paul gets back to in regards to the circumcision and what, what is the importance of it. There's so much importance to keeping his work. Because like PD mentioned, circumcision is almost like a code word, but it includes everything in regards to walking, as you should walk, walking in accordance to the word of God, the Torah of God. And there's absolutely so much importance there for us as believers in Yeshua. Right. And so, you know, he says, he says in Romans 3, hey, um, there is no one righteous. No, not one. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all, um, you know, and, you know, that that's that's a scary thought in a way, but that needs to bring us back to humility. It needs to bring us back to the, the idea of, you know, whoa, because it can easily become a thing for us that, you know, we um, like I made a video a, a few weeks ago about, you know, that, that story that Yeshua talked about with the, the Pharisee and the tax collector and this Pharisee who's like, Hey God, I tithe twice a week. I, I tithe and I fast twice a week. And, um, all these things that I do, I thank you God that I'm not like other men. And you know, whatever your line is there, whether it's God, I thank you that I do this. God, I thank you that this is who I am, my identity. God, I thank you that, that whatever it is, I thank you. I'm not like other men. God calls us to be humble and uh, not to boast in that at all. Right. And then he, Paul starts wrapping this thing up and he, and he, and he talks about the following. He says that in Romans 3 verse 20, that, and we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those who are in the Torah, that, so that every mouth might be stopped and all the world come under the judgment before God. Therefore, by works of Torah, no flesh shall be declared right before him. For by the Torah is the knowledge of sin. So by your own works to the law of God, you will not be declared righteous before God. That is not what is going to, excuse me, that's not what's going to um, make you appear spotless before him because you'll never be able to meet that standard. He, he says, but this is the point. The Torah is the knowledge of sin. Now, let me ask you, if you tell, a, if you've got a child and you tell your child, hey, there's cookies in that container, um, I'm putting it here on the shelf, you're not allowed to eat it. You're not allowed to take one cookie. Or they have now suddenly have a knowledge of what is wrong to do because you have instructed them in that way. Is that knowledge going to perfect them? Is that knowledge going to make them be obedient? In fact, I actually think that child is going to get up on that counter as soon as that parent walks out of the room. Because it's just like Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I do, I don't want to do. And that's uh, that's what an instruction does. It kind of It can be a temptation in that way if we live in our flesh, if we are un if we are unchanged, if our nature is still the old man. But now when the new man comes, the 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 if you will, or, or the old man dies in baptism and the law is written on our hearts, we give the get the Holy Spirit, our nature is changed. Now suddenly we see that cookie on the shelf and we hear our father God saying, Don't eat it. And we say, God, you know what? I don't want to eat it. I want to be obedient. I want to follow you. 
now suddenly there's a change of a heart and it's not no, no longer the flesh that that like a child who's in their flesh who you know from the womb we sin now suddenly there's a change and by the spur that's in us we live in righteousness to um, and and by our faith then in him we then come in right standing with him by the blood that cleanses us right like pd just said so there we have when we walk according to the flesh or when we walk according to the spirit paul even talks about that right in chapter eight which we'll get to later when he talks and he juxtaposes two different laws like he had spoke of previously in romans 7 the law of sin and death or the law of god like pd said you know i don't do what i want to do and and you know, just the opposition of the flesh battling against the spirit, walking in sin in opposition to God's law or walking in accordance to God's law. And so we have that the law, the spirit of life, which Paul talks about in Romans 8, which we can only keep God's law through his spirit. And even Paul says in Romans 7, the law is spiritual. God's law is spiritual. It is spirit. But then in opposition, there is the law of the flesh, walking in opposition to his law, disobeying. Right, exactly. But now we have to ask a question. Um, what about those who um, keep, who, who, let's say, they're, they haven't filled with the Spirit, they have a changed nature, you know, the laws written on their hearts and all that has happened, but they're not obedient to all the instructions. There's, there, there's a real change in their life. You can see everything that they've that's changed. The, they, they, they got free from a drug addiction. They stopped drinking. They, whatever happened, they, 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 their spirit, the Spirit in them convicts them of their sin. But when it comes to certain instructions, they're not changed yet. They're, they're still doing certain things. And, and I want to submit that we see that often when there is a lie. Now, and what I mean by that is you can be filled with the Spirit. You can have the Spirit talking clearly to you. Um, and, you know, that's that conviction in your heart. That, uh, and, and by nature, you start acting differently. But if if you if let's say the spirit convicts you of one thing right the spirit tells you as an example rest on the seventh day okay that's that's what the spirit tells you in, in your inside you're like i'm so tired i don't know why but i just feel like i need to get with god i feel like i need to just i need to kind of just like have a date with him i need to just be with him and and the spirit convicts you of that and you're like oh i want to rest and you and you go to your pastor and you're like oh pastor i feel like i need to rest i need to i feel like you know pastor i actually read my bible last night and i saw this and this this one commandment and the ten commandments and it, it told me to to rest on the seventh day and and that's exactly what i've been feeling all, all along even before i read it because it's written on your heart right and but now the pastor tells you oh no 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 don't worry about that one that one is abolished that one that one has changed oh that one we don't do that one anymore or oh that one it's not on the seventh day it's actually on the eighth day or whatever the thing is the lie is we can now come and we now we're at a crossroad now we can make a decision will we believe the pastor the teaching of a man or will we follow the conviction of the Spirit on our heart and what which points to the Word of God? Because see, the Spirit will always point you back to the, the, the written Word that we have. Because the Word that is here is the same Word, law, that's written on our heart. The law that is that has been given in the beginning is not a different law that's written on your heart. It is, remember, Jeremiah 31 verse 31, that's, and the day of the prophet Jeremiah. When Jeremiah talks about the law, he's talking about the Torah. He's not talking about some other law. He's talking about the law that everyone, including himself, knew. And he's saying, a day is going to come when God's going to write that law on your heart. The same law that's written here, and it's, he's going to change your nature to be able to keep it. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read this passage to you guys. Um, and this is kind of his conclusion, if you will, to this whole matter. And, and he says, Romans 3, verse um, 21, he says, But now, apart from the Torah, a righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. Okay, that's interesting. He says, apart from the Torah, there's a righteousness, but it's been witnessed by the Torah. So the Torah has all along been pointing to this one thing and witnessing of this thing that he's about to talk about but it's not the Torah itself. It's, 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 the Torah is not the substance. The Torah is the witness of this substance. And this is what the substance is. He says that the righteousness of God is through the belief in Yeshua. Messiah 
to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the, glory, of the esteem of God, being declared right without paying for his favor through the redemption which is in Messiah Yeshua, who God set forth as an atonement through belief in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his tolerance God has passed over the sins that had taken place before. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he is righteous and declares righteous the one who has belief in Yeshua. Where then is the boasting? It is shut out. <laughs> by what Torah? Of works? No, 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 no. But by the Torah of belief. By the law of belief. For we reckon that a man is declared right by belief without works of Torah. For or is he the God of the Jews only and not of the nations? Yes, of the nations too. Since it is one God who shall declare right the uncircumcised by belief and the, the circumcised by belief and the uncircumcised by belief. Do we then nullify the Torah through belief? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. <coughs> this so, verse is, sorry, I'm going to jump in really this verse is imperative and it's foundational because as he sums up this or as he concludes this um, talk and what he's um, talking about, do we then nullify the law through this faith? No, we do not. Just in case you might have misunderstood anything I've said. No, we uphold the law of God. And like Pity was saying a moment ago, the Torah points to Yeshua. Paul talks about it later in Romans 10 when he says, he says uh, in the English translation, Christ is the end of the law. Well, that's interesting because that means we don't have the law anymore, right? It's the end. Go back to the Greek. That word end is the word telos, which we even have in the word telescope. The law, the Torah points towards Christ. Christ, Yeshua, is the fulfillment. He brings the clarification of everything that the Torah spoke of. He point, pointed towards Yeshua and he's revealed in Torah. And so in that, do we nullify the law through this faith in Yeshua? Yeshua who walked according to his father's instructions and he called us to walk as he walked? Do we nullify it through this faith in Yeshua? Of course not. We uphold this Torah because that is what it means to follow Yeshua, to walk as he walked, to be in obedience to his father's commands, even as Yeshua himself was. As he said in John, I and the Father are one, so he would not have taught anything against the Torah. He was perfect in that way because he could not break Torah. Of course, he would have sinned because sin is lawlessness. And we are to walk in accordance and walk in Yeshua's footsteps. So even as Paul is agreeing with everything Yeshua taught, he is not in contradiction to everything Yeshua taught. He is not promoting a different gospel where he's gotten rid of the law. He is in saying the exact same thing Yeshua said. We are to walk in accordance to the Father's instructions through faith. Exactly. And he actually says on the way in there, on the contrary, we establish the Torah. That's a big one, guys. He's saying by this um, belief, by this, we're not nullifying the Torah. Don't get me wrong. We are establishing it. In other words, I want to ask you the question. In your life, are you establishing the Torah through your belief in Messiah? Because see, if you do not, then you're not walking as he walked. It's the simple fact that Yeshua did walk in the accordance and obedience to his father's instructions to the T. And then he says, now walk as me. Walk as I walk. And when we do that, we establish a Torah. Yeshua further said in Matthew 5, verse 17 and onward, he says that, don't think, please don't think by what I say. Don't misunderstand me to think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I've come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. I came to fill that glass up to the brim. I've came to bring fullness of meaning to it. Fulfill does not mean abolish in any way or form. It means to bring it to its completion, to bring it to its fullness and not to fill it up to throw it away because that would contradict just the previous line of say, saying when he said, I didn't come to abolish it. I didn't come to throw it away. I came to give it meaning. I came, it pointed to me. It is all about me. And I am the one who gives it all of it meaning. Without me, the Torah is meaningless. It is unfulfilled. That is what he's saying. And he then goes on to say something incredibly scary. He says, 
Whoever then goes to teach against, whoever says that one of the least of these commandments, talking about his father's instructions, the Torah and the prophets, like he said in the previous verses, whoever teaches that one of the least of these is abolished will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Hey, they may make it into heaven, but they'll be called least in the kingdom. And he, now he's setting a, a ranking in heaven. And he says next that whoever t does and teaches the commandments of God will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because you cannot be great. You, who is great in this world? Those who are judges, those who are, are, are high in the governmental system. Because remember, it's going to be a governmental priesthood um, system in when we are with him he is going to be king and there's going to be a just like today there is going to be a a uh, just there's going to be a government and those who know and teach and do what he has done and teach and he, those are those who are going to be great in his kingdom that's the simple fact of what he is saying in matthew 5 and so god calls us he calls us all into that priesthood with him he calls us all to be priests. He calls us all to walk in obedience to his father's instructions. That's all that Yeshua came and do is point back to his. He said, I come to bring a new thing, but that which my father given you from the beginning. And he says, now do that because that is how, that is how you demonstrate your love to me and to my father. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. <laughs> exactly. It's so like Petey was saying when Yeshua spoke in Matthew 5, he did not come to abolish Torah, but to fill it to the brim, to fulfill it in that way, to show us the depth of Torah that had even been missed. Like Paul talks about getting back to faith. It's not just the outward sign. I did this. I did that command. It's the inward transformation. And as Yeshua goes on, when he talks about the gospel of the kingdom, it's not just, did you do this tithe? Did you make that sacrifice? Which is in Torah. But it's, what's your heart behind that? Are you also walking in the spirit of Torah, as Paul talks about in Romans 8? So when Yeshua went out and um, walked in the gospel of the kingdom, which is a message of restoration, which is all what the Torah is all about, restoring what was broken to fullness, from death to life, from darkness to light. When he went out and physically brought healing to those who were in need of healing, that is Torah. When he um, brought sight to those who were blind, that is Torah. It's bringing that restoration, bringing that light where there was darkness. That is the purpose of God's Torah, to bring light into our physical bodies as we walk in obedience to his word in every way, as well as in our spiritual man, that we can walk through his spirit in obedience to him in that relationship with him. And that is what Paul's also affirming. Do we nullify this law through, the, through this faith in Yeshua? No, we establish it. I'm showing you a deeper way that we're not just to just do these things for the sake of doing it. Even as Yeshua said, what is your heart? We're establishing it by making it even more. It is through faith that we are obedient, that we walk as Yeshua walked, that we follow in his footsteps and his spirit enables us to do so. Amen. <laughs> exactly. I think that's that's an amazing way to kind of summarize this. Um, and so, guys, I hope this blessed and encouraged you. Um, we we kind of went through Romans one to three now. Um, we we're gonna. This is gonna be a series of videos where I'm gonna be going through the book of Romans, and we're gonna go through every single chapter to go through all of the big points like this. Thank you so much for sticking through. I hope that this blessed and encouraged you to get into this book and to read it again. I encourage you to go and read it again. Don't just listen to what we've been telling or saying. Go and read it. Dig into this with intimacy with the Father and seek what he is really trying to tell us through a Paul. Because Paul was so inspired and filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Spirit to understand what he's saying. So I want to just, I want to just end this off in, in a prayer. Um, right. So, yeah, Christina, if you wanted to add anything, um, you're welcome to also do so. But yes, so Father, uh, God, I just thank you, Yahweh, so much for your word, Father. I pray, Lord, over everyone who's watching right now, God, that you would just give them an incredible insight into your um, your writings, Lord, and in, in, in the Apostle Paul's writings. I pray that you would open their their eyes, Lord, and help them see, Father, what you're really trying to say. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be humble, help us to consider ourselves as the least and others always better than our uh, than ourselves and i pray father for 
Help us to understand this message of salvation. Help us to be obedient in, in, in to you and to walk as you walked. And help us to also not get sidetracked to think that that's what declares us right. Help us to remember and keep our eyes on you, Yeshua. You're the one who gives us salvation and grace. And I pray, Father, that you would just, Lord, remind us of that, Lord, and, and, and bring us to that deeper, deeper revelation, Father. Lord, I pray this in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah. Yes, Father, we also come in agreement that you'll touch our hearts and you'll speak to us and that everything that we've shared that will, it's your words that has been spoken today, Father, and so that we can listen to this, but we can draw closer in relationship to you, Father, that each one of us personally will come to you and desire that intimate relationship with you because you are calling out to each one of us, say, follow me, come and follow me because I love you so much. And we thank you for your word that you've given us so that we can know how to love you and how to love our neighbor and how to be a light that you've called us to be a light, Father. So we thank you so much for that, Father. We thank you for who you are, our King, who we love so much. Your name is holy. Thank you, Father, for everything you've done in this message and that you will bless everyone who has listened. In Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, guys, thank you so much for sticking through. Like this video if, it's like, if you like this and please share it with your friends and subscribe to this YouTube channel to stay tuned for the next episode. May God bless you and keep you and we'll see you guys in the next video. Shalom. Shalom.